Um, tell me something about the various companies which you set up and the technologies behind those. That would be fascinating. Well, um, so the first company I was involved in uh, with Herman Hauser was a company that sold the Cambridge Ring. So there were four companies that sold the Cambridge Ring altogether, and ours was, was one of them. And that started around the same time that CPU, the company that most people know as Acorn, uh, started as well. And very quickly, that was started by Herman and Chris Curry. But they were in the same place, as I recall, in Market Square, and uh, we amalgamated those companies into one very quickly. So I wasn't quite a depends what you mean by a founder or a startup of Acorn. Acorn's the wrong name, it was CPU, and then CPU was a combination of Orbis, this previous company, and um, uh, CPU. So fairly quickly, there were the three of us, we were shareholders, I was the smallest shareholder, very much smaller than the others, uh, and there we go. That Orbis company sold the ring, did quite well, but we stopped selling the ring because we decided doing home computing is better and so I concentrated on the chips for those machines and the networks for those machines and switched into doing stuff for the home computer company rather than the ring company. Although the other companies selling Cambridge rings did okay and that whole thing lasted for quite some time and, and it was okay. So Acorn did very well and then did less well and then Olivetti came along and took a majority stake in, in Acorn. Um, and I was uh, one of the directors, and they asked me to um, uh, uh, start an industrial research lab uh, for them directly, rather than working in Acorn. But well, there was a little slither of time in between them coming and that, them ask, making that proposition. I started another company, which was a company called QDOS, Q-U-D-O-S, Quick Design on Silicon, not a bad name. <laughs> and that was a company that had some CAD software, CAD software for designing chips and was actually a manufacturer of simple chips by using electron beam prototyping by direct writing onto uh, a surface uh, each chip one at a time. Um, that, did, that joined the living dead. It still exists uh, and is based at Rutherford Labs and that could have been a spectacular success but not every one of your companies has a spectacular success and that one wasn't. And the, thing that we missed is that the hardware side, making the chips, was a very capital intensive business and quite hard and the volumes weren't there because you wrote each one at a time and so the margins would have to be much higher on each chip and you didn't, you know, so that didn't work out. The CAD side of the business could have gone gangbusters global but we didn't yes. prioritize that and that's called a company called Cadence, nothing to do with us but there we go. But that was 1985, if I recall correctly. So, so there was Orbis, Acorn, slash CPU, QDOS, and then Olivetti Research Limited. And Olivetti Research Limited was set up as a separate company. So, yeah, the budgets came from Olivetti much of the time, but it was a separate operating company. I was the CEO, and it's the only time I've been a CEO. This is all in parallel with doing my university thing where I was an assistant lecturer, lecturer, reader, professor, all the usual sort mm. of uh, things. Um, no particular accommodation by any of those processes for all this other stuff. Uh, I, I think if I might put it this way, in terms of my academic pals here in Cambridge, I'm the sort of most industrial parallel one. Uh, so when I've started something, I've gone with it and done it for a reasonable length of time, rather than designing the technology and launching it and leaving it to others. Um, so, uh, Olivetti Research Lab went, uh, I would say anyway, very well. Uh, but Olivetti started doing not so well, and so we decided we better uh, do something about returns, otherwise we're going to be dead. So while we started spinning out companies and so the, this very important change uh, which is very appropriate today but uh, anyway uh, times have moved on the world is different where you get some research you do the research you assume that your team is good enough so you have something that's exemplary the best in the world whatever you then offer it to the sponsor the business unit 
uh, if, uh, if they don't use it, then you do something else with it, but they get a cut of whatever the else is. So uh, the cascade goes, you spin out a company with external capital, so you find some money, spin it out, and the, company, the, the original company gets a cut of it. If, if that doesn't work, you try and license it. And if that doesn't work, it doesn't work, I mean, you're, you're actually too busy doing everything. So it all works, except you've got to, you can't do everything all at the same time. So you're doing all these things in parallel. Then you open source it or you keep it going in some way because technology is all about, you know, uh, uh, probably sort of some kind of analogy with boxing. You know, you get the next round and you do different weights and, you know, it might be a bantamweight contest, it might be a heavyweight contest. But you want to keep going because you might still knock out the bugger <laughs> in the next round rather than saying I give up, right? Mm. So open source or some other method of keeping it going mm. uh, and not putting it on the shelf and not hoarding technology not to be used. In other words, putting it into the dustbin is very, very important. So we fell into that sort of cascade of, of, of maximizing opportunity by doing all this stuff. And at the same time, we started getting other sponsors for the research in addition to Olivetti. And this was not competing with, with the university. Uh, you know, I said to everybody, said, uh, who worked for me, and there were up to about 60 of us, that's a, a quite big. Um, if you want to be academic, you can do the same thing as I do. You can simultaneously do your academic thing, but then you have to do it in the university, because we're not competing for good reason with the university. We're not pretend to be the university of anything, we're a more funky downstream applied lab with actually more resource, uh, and that's what we do. Uh, so anyway, that worked very well, and then Digital Equipment Corporation funded us, Oracle funded us, had quite a few suitors, and eventually Olivetti sold the company to AT&T, and we became the AT&T lab. So the companies were Olivetti Research Limited, then what became Virata was the first spin out, then at Telemedia Systems, which still exists, which does software which would help you with this particular problem, which helps with fast editing of multimedia material, and mm. all this sort of stuff, uh, producing different versions of it. Then there was a wireless company which was called Adaptive Broadband, uh, that were all spun out of that industrial lab. So it's Adaptive Broadband is the next one. Then Adaptive Broadband. Uh, spawned Cambridge Broadband, which is another wireless company of which I was chairman for quite a few years. That happened in 2000, uh, that company started. Uh, and then the industrial lab was shut by AT&T in 2002, and that's very bad news and very good news. So the very bad news is that it was completely unnecessary, and I had two people who wanted to buy it, and the whole thing shouldn't have happened, but it was just being trashed by an American owner. The good news is it completely carries on as companies, of which I myself have uh, three at the moment. Um, uh, chairman of, well, it's actually four at the moment, to be precise. I'm chairman of three and uh, director of the fourth just at the moment. Uh, but there are others uh, because the projects uh, within that industrial lab were good and strong and the teams were strong. It's all about people. Uh, the people have stuck together. And again, of course, non-competing with the university, that there was a great premium on the teamwork in that place and recognition of teamwork and, and rejection of individual. You could do individual stuff, but it was a team play place. That was one of the advantages you could do. Um, so I've become some, I don't know, a dozen companies uh, in Cambridge, and we still meet and we still have drinks, and we just had our anniversary, and you know, mm. my PA still organizes it, and you know, but it looks a bit older, but it all carries on. And so, but my three companies, as opposed to this diaspora stuff, uh, uh, there is a company called Will BNC, which is a software company. There's a company called Ubisense, which is a uh, location technology plus software company. There's a company called Solarflare, which is a 10 gigabit Ethernet chip company. And th they in turn have children now, so there's another company called Eventic, which I'm chairman, which is uh, another chip uh, company. And then I'm on the advisory board of uh, yet another one of these children companies, uh, and, and I've invested a bit in that. So it's about a dozen uh, at the moment that I've directly done myself and been a director and co-founder, and then indirectly, God knows how many whole whole mafia out there of this stuff. And it's it's still pretty tight, and there's a culture, and it, and it does go back to Acorn, but it also goes back to this Olivetti lab, because that actually lasted rather longer than the kind of acorn culture mm -hmm. in its own way. It came from that. Uh, the Olivetti lab lasted 16 years. 
So, you know, it's, and it was, as I said, not a bad size for research output. So that's my, my lot. And of bottom line, if you want sort of some kind of summary, the good news is some have done well. So Acorn did very well, went public, uh, you know, uh, had a very nice valuation for a while. Mirata went public. Uh, that had a, a very high value. You know, at the peak it was five billion, and I think fifty. We counted millionaires in Cambridge on paper, just in Cambridge. So that was good. Uh, some joined the Living Dead. Nothing wrong with that. Um, and some are at the races. And who knows? And uh, the ones uh, in play right now. Uh, well, again, there are a very motley lot of wonderful companies. Uh, and what I'm talking about is, is the diversity of, of each one. So, for example, the 10 gigabit Ethernet chip company has over $120 million of venture capital funding. So this is a huge amount of money, and this is going you know, all or nothing. Uh, in terms of a real mainstream product, called it 10 gig Ethernet chip, which will eventually end up not quite in a camera, but you know, in, in, in mainstream platforms. And, you know, again, I can give you the whole technology chain of why that has a position, but it's the capital chain that's interesting. That is that much money, and most of it from uh, the West Coast. Uh, Ubisense, uh, this tag plus location tag plus software company, that has attracted a lot of Angel Capital, as far as I know, it's the biggest angel-funded company in the UK. I'm chairman there, and uh, it's eight million pounds of, of venture cap uh, of uh, angel capital. So what can, what cap capital? Angel. Angel, yes. Yeah, so people like you, I pass my hat round and I say, oh, oh, I see. Could yeah. I have you know, a few bob and you throw it in? Mm, I see. Yeah. So, personal investments by individuals. Some of them, you know, have quite a bit of firepower. You know, they put in a million. But, uh, but nevertheless, hmm. and then the third one, in, in this, just to illustrate this amazing hmm. spectrum, is a company called Real VMC. Um, that's a software company, and it's a sort of uh, amazing thing about the internet. So it's something that we open sourced originally because we were so busy doing all this other hmm. impact stuff that uh, uh, we just open sourced that one. We now run a company that sells a version of that stuff. This VNC technology is remote control. You can get it to another computer for control purposes easily. It's a graphics technology. It's the world's most popular technology for this. So there are, well, I don't know how many, but it's certainly at least 100 million, possibly more than 100 million licenses have been taken. When I say possibly, you can't count. You know, we know how many went off this site, but mm. who knows what's happening with this stuff. Um, and profitable from the word go, um, We've kept it small, we've kept it deliberately what it is, it's growing fast, um, it's printing money, and uh, it's very wholesome, and no capital, mm -hmm. it's, 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 you know, it's no capital. We worked for nothing for a mm -hmm. couple of years, but we didn't take any investment, we didn't take any investment, mm -hmm. and this thing is everywhere, I'm just yeah. everywhere. Any seminar I give, if I want to just warm them up a little bit, who's using VNC? You know, half the audience, <laughs> put their hand up, not more than half, mm -hmm. or the tech audience. So, these, these are extraordinary, you know, they're all different, mm. so the biggest, one of the biggest VC funded ones, one of the biggest angel funded ones, one of the biggest not funded by anything ones, <laughs> and, you know, it, and it just happens, right, it just happens, and this is all in parallel to the, to the university side, and, um, uh, you know, these two sides, people pay a lot of web service, but actually I would say you can't double up. So I haven't doubled up and I don't work twice as hard. And actually there is a price to pay on both sides mm. for doing the two. Uh, uh, on the academic side, I think uh, uh, there isn't, uh, uh, and I'm not sure there should be, I don't know, but there isn't any particular accommodation that one is doing this sort of stuff, which actually I think is important for the university, but I don't think there's mm. any particular... to change departments to get a chair, right? So, uh, so there we go. Uh, and on the industrial side, uh, you end up, as compared to uh, being leaving the university and being fully engaged with the company, sort of indefinitely. Um, again, you tend not to rise or go with it quite to the 
level that you could have done had you done it. Mm. So, there are, so there are good things you can do. Instead of upsetting your risk and you're enjoying two different worlds, also do farming, that's a completely different world, you know, mm. worth all garbage uh, kind of stuff, that's fine. So, you know, the, there's mm. enjoyment of all that sort of mm. stuff. And through the university, it's the non-techie friends, which are just as important as the techie friends. So that's another dimension. But there is a price. I was just going to, I mean, it's an astounding story. I just don't know how you managed to do, well, the three things, the, air, the flying obviously takes a lot of time, the, the university and the other, I mean. Well, the flying is slightly sideways because that, in terms of actual time per week, uh, isn't great and it lines up with holidays and things like that. Yeah. But how do you com manage to do the other two things? I mean, uh, Well, I don't know, it just happens. I, I don't have any method, I don't do any, anything different. Uh, I would just say that... Um, uh, it's all about people, you surround yourself with good people, you delegate and you forget it. Uh, and you, you, you build a level of trust where the delegation works uh, and, you, you know, you, you, on, the, on the long term, you, you win by doing that. So in the university, uh, uh, you know, running the computer lab is sweet and lovely and takes no time at all because, first of all, compared to being the CEO of an industrial research lab, where he has to find money, which has to commercialize, doing my own HR, doing my own everything, the computer lab is a total doddle, right? What's the problem? You know, mm. Blink and you've done it. So mm. that, that's straightforward. Um, because you, there's not much, what, what are you supposed to do? You know, you can't do much about all sorts of things. Mm. So you can do one or two dimensions and that doesn't take very long. Um, on the industrial side... Well, do you do lecturing and teaching and... Oh, yeah. PhD supervising. Well, I, I, I've just done my 50th PhD students, and I think mm. I have the biggest group of places. Yeah, but again, what's the problem? You know, I mm. got whatever it is, four or five postdocs, mm. lots of PhD students, all that the whole machine works. But mm. again, I, I have good postdocs, I have good students. Mm. <laughs> what's, mm. what's the problem? Mm. Um, and I'm not trying to prove myself against them, and they're not trying to prove themselves to me too much. It's, it, it's a team play, right? So it's, mm. it's, and this doesn't always gel well with the university system at large, not on Cambridge, where mm. you, you've got a strong team uh, group mm. kind of thing. But that's what makes, you know. Um, and then on the, on the industrial side, uh, I was only CEO of that one company. Mind mm. you, I did that for 15, 16 years. So, so mm. you just do it, I don't know. But there you've got resource to, to mitigate. So, you know, uh, you, you got money, you got people, uh, so you just have to use that to your advantage to make it possible to do it. Concentrate on the things, the contribution you, you can make. In my case, sniff out new things pretty well, so concentrate on that. And then concentrate on the bets you're making on those things. And then um, uh, uh, on the academic side, uh, you know, again, it helps. If you're participating in the academic side, both your immediate side and your pals around the university now in co congruent in cognitive disciplines from the social side. So you've got kind of a uh, radar screen out there where it's, it's not very likely that you'll miss something. You might not be able to do it, but you'll be aware of it. Right? Mm -hmm. So that's your broader university radar screen. You've got your immediate research group, which if it's healthy, is, is producing results in the sense of academic results, papers, and trained people in particular with the right thing in their mind. You're participating in industry, big and small, so you've got the small company where you've got focus, but then you're working or are part of a multinational, so you're seeing how that works going. And then you finally participate in the financial side, so you look at the tree and you see what sort of money is growing on that tree and what, you know, what's, what's bearing good fruit today on the capital side, capitalist, capital side, what the market's like, so money can I raise, it angel funding, is it VC funding, are the public markets, is this fashion, was that fashion, blah, blah, blah. So then, if you now just put that together, it's obvious. <laughs> obvious but, to but, you. Well, it is, because, because you've got the knowledge, right? It's like yeah. Fred Hasgo, you know, winning mastermind or whatever it was, you know, the taxi driver, he's got the knowledge of, of, of a taxi driver, so to speak. So, so it's something in, in, in all that. But uh, uh, as I say, uh, 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 and I'm not uh, in, in any way sort of uh, uh, reflecting badly on anything. I'm just commenting that you lose a little bit uh, mm. across this as well. So 
So if one were to concentrate on any one thing, and it would be even, mm -hmm. you know, uh, if I had concentrated on the firms, for example, I'd probably you know, have a substantial firm I'd be a big boss of, and you know, there mm -hmm. we go. Whether it would be better or not, I don't know. But, but there is. Mm -hmm. Similarly, on the academic side, uh, uh, if you uh, uh, start using some kind of measure like journal paper citations, mm -hmm. then uh, I don't mm -hmm. come out very well at all. I was wondering, um, journal is, paper is Kim citations by other journals, <laughs> which are in the Thompson directory. If you yes. take me as a cited author, actually, I'm a highly cited author, but if you take the more academic mm. perspective on that, mm. then not. I mean, is Cambridge a good place for doing what you're doing? It's getting less good, but it's still a very good place. Uh, it's getting less good because. Uh, uh, the world we live in, so it's not necessarily Cambridge fault. Um, uh, government pressures, competitive pressures, um, and all that sort of stuff. So the wriggle room has reduced. Mm. So I was one of the wriggling type, right? Uh, mm. And, and that, that, that David Wheeler was, was in that sense, mm. he, he was in the wriggle room, and there's less wriggle room. So, mm. um, and while I'm, uh, you know, established, as they say, more than established, I'm past it, uh, perhaps. Uh, a newcomer coming in, uh, you know, is confronted with the measurement situation as it is. So, for example, in my immediate research group, it's okay because they can cuddle up. My postdocs, I like to say, can cuddle up to me. I get the very best, and you know, I fix consulting there. I get uh, uh, it's all mm. sort of put together, and, and they're happy. But if not for that, they wouldn't exist in the university, mm. and so that doesn't scale. Mm. So it can be, you can have a little pocket here, a little pocket there, but there we mm. go. So it'll be interesting uh, how this develops in the next 10 or 20 years. And this is compounded by the subject uh, uh, moving on, where when I uh, started, uh, there weren't hundreds of companies and all that sort of stuff, now there are. However, we, we, we're still in the university able to, uh, to do stuff. Uh, but it just takes a little more thought. And so we have a theme in the computer lab in my own research, what I call in a slightly uh, populist way, computing for the future of the planet. Okay, so we have a mm -hmm. theme. That's a sort of banner description of it, which actually has meaning, but it's also a, a banner. Uh, future planet, good words, computing. But what it means is, uh, what's the engineering approach, if you like, uh, or operational approach, uh, to solving some of the major problems and what role does computing uh, play in it and indeed is computing part of the solution in the sense that it's indispensable to solve mm. some of these things. So if you imagine observing the world, the real physical world using sensors in great detail and then using that data uh, to optimize some energy cost or something mm. and then feeding that back as a pricing mechanism or just information. That might be an example of something like that, or uh, which is why I have links with Africa as well as this sort of technological thing. Because if you think of those developing countries, the platform they're going to have is the mobile phone of some kind, or the thing currently called a phone, but it's the mobile computer. Um, it may be that by enabling much more wealth creation in that world, in cyberspace based on uh, mobiles, their standard of living will increase and therefore their family size won't be quite, on average, as mm. big as it is now because of better standard of living. And that's a method for dealing with population growth, or one of the methods, at least the one that I can do something about. So you can find lines like that, and that's a line which it's easier to do in a university because even in a large company which has loads of money, like Google or Microsoft, even this, even there, it would be at the periphery to say, well, I'm actually trying to develop platforms which will relate to the family size in Africa, mm -hmm. right? I can't, I can say that with a straight face in a university situation, but I can't even in a very rich company research lab situation. So, uh, well, I would say it's less appealing there. Um, so there is a role for the university, but it's a little more uh, along, those, uh, along those lines. But we have that uh, in the computer lab, and it's a theme and leading the computer lab from behind because it's very important uh, for a head of department uh, not to lead from in front, so to speak, to suggest, encourage, trap, so on, but never tell. Um, but I, you know, I've, I like I've the word up, trap. I've, I've snuck, I've snuck up on them. Snuck up on them. Yeah. Is there snuck anything? It up on them. <laughs> it's delightful. But 
I feel there's many more things one could discuss, but is there anything, any large area of your life which I have managed to well, miss? Well, that's my family. Yes. Tell so me. family is wife, Alison mm. Smith, plant sciences department, and her time is just coming, not her person is coming in the sense that she's fine, but her biofuels and how to really do it and what does it mean and GMO mm. organisms and uh, growing things that are appropriate, new things mm. that are appropriate for generating energy is, is one of the line. And then uh, two children aged 13 and 12. And Girls or boys? A boy and a girl. Mm. And uh, there we go. So that's... Uh, and that's you manage it. all that as well. <laughs> that's, 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 that's in the... And the farm, as I say, so wheat and barley and the all gathered in the water. Well, really? Uh, you, you do all that as well? Yeah, so it's 100 and something acres and uh, you know, it's proper farm where we flog this stuff and you know, all that. But that's, that's, that's managing a farm, not farming, mm. although I do have tractors. You know, it's back to the oil leaf and brain, oxygen, and all that sort of... What a phenomenon, yeah. if I may say so. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much indeed for a lovely interview. Okay.